Hey everyone, Aaron here from MTG Challengers, and welcome to another Magic the Gathering deck tech. Today's deck tech is going to be over junk midrange. For those of you that don't know, in Magic, the word junk refers to the color alignment of green, white, and black. Uh, it's a color combination that I really, really thoroughly enjoy playing. I think it has an excellent balance of disruption, removal, and creatures, and especially here. This is probably uh, my favorite deck that I've built so far in this season of Theros and it's been doing really, really well for me. So without further ado, let's get started. Beginning with my creatures, first off I have Sylvan Karyatid. Uh, so two mana, zero three, Defender Hexproof, and you can tap it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So it's a functional Farseek, essentially. Uh, it's not quite as good as Farseek because it can, of course, be wrathed away with, like, Supreme Verdict. Um, but being a zero three, it does serve a dual purpose. Uh, it can fix you. And while it's doing that, it can also fend off any smaller creatures that uh, aggro decks like Red Deck Winds are going to be playing. And as far as mana dorks go, it's vastly superior, at least in this particular deck, to like Elvish Mystic. Because uh, seeing how it is three colors, uh, you really do need it to be one mana of any color. Um, you just need the fixing. So four Karyatid should be fairly obvious. Um, basically, it is really a far seek. Essentially, uh, every... Um, mid-range deck running green, it's basically you always have four of these. So moving on, uh, we have four copies of Voice of Resurgence, and Voice of Resurgence is just an absurdly awesome creature. Um, so it's a two-drop, two-two, and whenever an opponent casts a spell during your turn, or whenever Voice of Resurgence dies, put a green and white elemental token onto the battlefield with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of creatures you control. So it has all kinds of implications within the game. Uh, I like to think of it as sort of a miniature Thrag Tusk, if that makes any sense, because uh, it's essentially two bodies in one, so um, they're going to be uh, at a card disadvantage to get rid of it. It's great against aggro decks because, uh, again, it can block twice and it can hold their little dudes at bay. Uh, to your benefit, and it's great against control because it deters them casting things on your turn, like counter spells and Sphinx's Revelations and things like that. And it's just a great creature all around because it produces tokens uh, that are the power and toughness are each equal to the number of creatures we control. And there is a fair amount of creatures in this deck, and its synergy, I particularly like its synergy with Elspeth, the Sun's Champion, which I'll get to in a minute, since she uh, turn, turns out just a huge amount of creatures that uh, the uh, elemental token can take advantage of. Um, for more budget-oriented players who want to build this deck, uh, Scavenging Ooze would be uh, a fairly nice uh, substitution for the Voice of Resurgence. It's still a very nice card, and uh, it's much less expensive. It's still a little bit pricey, uh, but it's nowhere near the price of the Voice. So if you don't want to shell out all the money on the Voices of Resurgence, Scavenging Ooze would be uh, a viable replacement. Um, but if you really want a competitive deck and you want to do well, then you really should get the voices. It's just a much better card overall in my experiences with this deck. Moving on to the three drop creature I have, and it is of course Loxodon Smiter. You guys know me, uh, you know I always love to play four Loxodon Smiters in any deck with green and white in it. Um, just because the card is pure value, a three mana for a four four that can't be countered, and if a spell or ability uh, an opponent controls will cause you to discard it, you put it onto the battlefield instead. The uh, discard clause will rarely happen because uh, Jund is really no longer a force in the metagame at this point, so things like Rakdos' Return aren't seeing that much play, and of course Liliana the Veil and that sort went out of standard. Um, so there's like Thoughtseize, but that's more or less irrelevant. Um, because they, of course, get to choose what gets discarded, so uh, they're not going to give you a free creature. But I I'm just really waiting for the game when they thought sees me and I have three lands, four smiters, and just <laughs> they have to pick the smiter, and I'm like, oh, thank you very much. But really, um, it's great. It's just an all-around great card. It's great against aggro because it can keep basically every creature that they have uh, on the ground at bay. It's great against control, of course, because it can't be countered, particularly like mono blue and stuff. And again, it's just uh, a highly efficient creature. So now we're getting into the uh, bigger sort of win conditions of the deck as far as the creatures go. Next up, we have three Desecration Demons. So it's a four mana double black, 6-6 uh, six, six flying. And the, at the beginning of each combat, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If they do, you tap the demon and put a plus one plus one counter on it. So 
it's an extremely efficient uh, beater with um, an, a quite interesting downside because it is a downside, let's be honest. We would definitely just rather it be uh, vanilla 6-6 six, six flying for 4 mana, but that would just be quite unreasonable. But with stuff like Lingering Souls uh, out of standard and players are just not able to create creatures as readily to be able to feed to the demon, uh, he's gotten tremendously better um, in the season of Theros. Again, he can serve two roles. He can control your opponent's board state. They you know, keep sacrificing things to tap him so he can attack. Or if they don't have any creatures on the board and they're not running into any removal on their deck, you can just beat face with a 6-6 flyer. So Desecration Demon is very, very good and one of the main reasons to be running black in this deck. Moving on, we have two Blood Baron of Viscopa. So five mana, one black, one white. 4-4, uh, four, four. lifelink, protection from white and from black, and as long as you have 30 or more life and an opponent has 10 or less life, Blood Baron of Escopa gets plus 6, plus 6, and has flying. Um, the, the, the second clause, um, it doesn't matter, honestly. All you need to know is it's a 4-4, four, four. it has lifelink, and pro white and black, which is absolutely huge in the format right now. More or less every removal spell there is is in white and black, um, with the exception of things like Mizium Orders is the big exception, but it's great against like Mono Black, who just, just can't remove it except with sacrificing outlets like Devour Flesh, and even then you do gain the life off of it. But it's just a really annoying creature that's going to stick around for a very long time and beat face and gain you back life. And after he's beaten face for a while, and you're at a high total and they're at a low total, he can just finish off the game by himself. So Blood Baron of Escopa is fantastic in this deck. So the final creature in my deck is Obsidot Ghost Council. I'm running two copies of him. So he's a 5-5 five, five for 5 mana, and when he enters the battlefield, target opponent loses 2 life and I gain 2 life. So he can gain me back a little bit of life and drain my opponent. But the real kicker with him is the second clause. At the beginning of each end step, you can exile him, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, bring him back, and he'll do the same thing again, target opponent will lose 2 life and you'll gain 2 life, and he has haste. So not only can you drain him, but he can also be a quite formidable attacker of 5-5. Five, five. So Obsidod is just absolutely crazy in this deck. And him along with the Blood Baron are really the, the two powerhouses of the deck. Um, mainly because they're both very resilient to removal, the Blood Baron being pro white and pro black and Obsidot uh, dodging all forms of sorcery speed removal because you're going to be blanking him out, and because they're outlets of life gaining, which is fairly important in a deck running a lot of black here. We're going to be paying a decent bit of life for the Shocklands down here, uh, for the Thought Seizes, as well as the Underworld Connections, which I'll get to in a minute. So uh, it is also nice. They're very formidable creatures on their own, but the fact that they gain life is also very, very nice in this deck. So that's it for the creatures. Moving on to the spells. As I mentioned before, I have Thought Seize. I have two main deck, two in the side. So it's one black mana. Target player reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card and you lose two life. So this card really should be self-explanatory. It's a classic. I'm really, really happy that they reprinted it in Theros. Well, it's the best discard spell ever printed. It disrupts just enough. You can do it early turns and take that one card they need to get that interaction right, or uh, you can use it as effective removal to get rid of, like, the gods or uh, other blood barons. Uh, that's another problem as well. Um, this deck of course is heavy white and heavy black so your opponents playing blood barons provided that you don't get yours out can be a bit of a problem so Thoughtseize can remedy that by just being able to take it out of their hand before they play it and it just has a ton of practical uses and even if they don't have uh, anything really threatening you still get the information uh, disruption is extremely important in any kind of mid-range control deck and Thoughtseize provides that uh, excellently so now we're getting on to the main removal package. First of all, I have one ultimate price. The reason it's there is because I was building the deck and I just had one spot open and I wanted another removal spell. And it was between ultimate price and Doomblade. Um, and I ultimately decided that in the format as it is, ultimate price is a little bit more relevant because there's a ton of black running around in the format. So uh, Doomblade's bias is pretty bad at least right now, and there's so much mono-colored devotion things running around, you know, mono green, mono blue, mono black, so ultimate price is a little bit more relevant in the format as it is than Doomblade, so that's why I chose it. Moving on, I have two Abrupt Decays, 
uh, one more on the side. Just an all-purpose removal spell for low-cost stuff. Um, it's great in a variety of matchups. It can be great against aggro, taking out their little guys. Great against mono blue, mono black. It can take out their Night Veil Spectres. Good against um, like blue-white control. It can take out their Detention Spheres. It just has all kinds of uses. Uh, up Again, up against the mono black matchup, they can take out their Underworld Connections and even stuff like Dark Prophecy if they're running it for the Devotion. So it has its uses. Uh, only two main board because it is fairly circumstantial. You're not always going to be able to use it. Unlike the next removal spell, which is Hero's Downfall, uh, running a full playset of it, which you really do need to be in this format right now, um, because, again, there's all the mono blue, mono black, um, and there's also a lot of Planeswalkers like Elspeth and Domery Raid running around and Garrick. Uh, you really need a way to get rid of them, and you also need a removal spell that just has no biases. It's just straight up destroy target creature, and uh, it's just very useful. Uh, having four is great, because again, it, it's not circumstantial at all. It can get rid of anything that your opponent has. Next spell is Advent of the Worm. Again, four copies of that. Um, just, I don't really know what to say about this card. It's just absolutely insane. 5-5 uh, five, five, Trample for 4 is one thing, but adding Instant onto that is just just w pushes it way over the top. Uh, you can do all, all kinds of cool things with it. You can uh, leave the 4 mana open, and they think you're bluffing, and they make a foolish decision, and you flash it in and screw up their combat math, or you just flash it in at the end of your turn and get some advantage off of that, flash it into block, uh, and you can even bluff, you can leave the 4 mana open so they think you have it, and not hand into their play that they were going to do that turn. There's just all kinds of practical applications for Advent to the Worm. And as soon as I saw it in the Dragon's May spoiler, I knew I was going to be playing four copies of it in some deck. And it fits into this deck very, very nicely, I must say. Next up is Underworld Connections, running two copies of those. Um, so you enchant land for three mana. Enchanted land has tap, pay one life, and draw a card. Um, really, really nice card advantage. I'm a firm believer in um, every mid-range slash control deck needing to have some way to get card advantage, and Underworld Connections does that very, very nicely. It also helps um, to keep from missing land drops, which is important. Um, and since magic is so much slower right now, in mid to late game, in the grindier matchups against mid-range and control, you can pile up a good deal of land because you've been consistently hitting your land drops, hopefully, with it and then you can just start to draw cards um, during your main phase and playing those immediately, you know, playing Blood Barons, playing Obsidots, you know, getting into your plays, you know, immediately because you've hit all your land drops and you being able to take advantage of that. And um, it's just, it, it does what it does. It provides some very, very nice card advantage. Um, it was either between this or Read the Bones, and again, because Standard is so much slower these days, I ultimately decided that Underworld Connections would be, uh, would provide a significantly greater amount of card advantage in the long run than would Read the Bones. So the final spell I have is a Planeswalker, Elspeth Sun's Champion, running two copies of her. Uh, she's just absolutely tremendous, especially in the slower meta. Uh, when I first uh, saw her in the Theros spoiler, I basically dismissed her out of hand, um, mainly just because of the mana cost. I was like, what a six mana planeswalker being highly played? There's no way. But I mean, she totally proved me wrong. Standard has just slowed down a good deal again, and so she's just been impacting the format tremendously. And she works very well on this deck. Uh, mainly what we're going to be using her for is her plus one. Uh, which you can just get three 1-1 one, one dudes um, to stabilize, pump out blockers, pump up voice of resurgence tokens. I really particularly love that interaction. And ultimately, you're just, you know, pumping out cheap attackers. And, uh, of course, they can protect her very well. And provided that your opponent doesn't rip a hero's downfall, you can just pump out the tokens and then ultimate her and give them plus two, plus two in flying and fly over for the win. Um, she's another a sort of big win condition of the deck, and she's been working out tremendously. So that's it for spells. Now let's take a quick look at the mana base. Uh, most of it should be fairly obvious. I, of course, have the uh, 12 Shocklands and the colors, 4 Overgrown Tomb, 4 Godless Shrine, and 4 Temple Garden. Then I have the Scryland, the only Scryland in the colors right now, unfortunately. The green and black one and the green and white one aren't available yet. Yeah, just the Temple of Silence is available, but of course I'm going to be running it. 
and the scrying function again uh, has a little bit of synergy with underworld connections and ensuring that I don't miss my land drops and scrying one is always reasonably nice. From there I have three Golgari Guildgate, two Selesnia Guildgate, and then uh, one basic land for each color. So one swamp, one forest, and one plains for a total of 24 lands. So really, really uh, right on in terms of the amount of lands. Some mid-range and control decks run a little bit more, but 24 is really fine for this deck because I do again have the scrying function as well as underworld connections to ensure that uh, rarely will I miss a land drop. Originally I was just running uh, play sets of these four and then eight basic lands, but I quickly discovered that I need more mana fixing, so um, I had to opt for some guild gates. Honestly, it's kind of pitiful, uh, the mana right now, that uh, we're having to play guild gates in serious competitive decks, but what else can you do, at least until the other five scry lands are printed. So that is it for the main board, now let's take a look at the sideboard. So the first card I have in the sideboard is Deathrite Shaman, running two copies of it. I originally had him in the main board, but I quickly realized that uh, he just really wasn't doing anything main board wise, uh, so I switched him over to the sideboard, and he serves his purpose here uh, quite well. Um, mainly he's here to just disrupt any graveyard interactions our opponent may be playing off of, like things like Whip of Erebos and uh, scavenge with like black green and he can also be sided into reasonable effectiveness against more aggressive decks to just provide uh, a little bit more life gain as well as an early turn blocker and to use his life loss ability he can also be sided in fairly effectively against some of the grindier matchups to just drain them in the same vein as like obzadot so next up is sin collector three mana two one and whenever he enters the battlefield, we get to look at our opponent's hand and choose an instant or sorcery card from it and exile that card. So, some more disruption if I need it, mainly against control, um, running things like Supreme Verdict and Sphinx's Revelation, just to be able to play that and get the information from their hand and take out uh, their most uh, capable threat uh, at any given time. Last creature in the board is another Blood Baron of Viscopa, mainly to side in against the mono black matchup, but any deck running white and black. It's just a creature that, again, is going to be very, very difficult for them to remove and is going to be bashing face and gaining me back life, so uh, it's definitely really nice and worth it to have a third one in the side uh, if I do need it. Moving on to spells, I have two more thought seizes. Again, just more disruption in the side if I need it. Uh, to get rid of cards that would be really difficult for me to get rid of otherwise. So like against Mono Blue, I can take out their Thassas. Against uh, other mid-range decks running white and black, I can take out their Blood Barons. And it just, again, serves a variety of uses, and it is there if I need it. And then I have three one ofs, which is basically my sideboard for my removal package. I have another Abrupt Decay, a Doom Blade, and another Ultimate Price. And these three will just switch in and out uh, depending on uh, what would behoove me for uh, each individual matchup. So if it's a non black deck that's running some multicolored stuff, I'd probably take out the Ultimate Price and throw in the Doom Blade. Or if it's a more aggressive deck or mono blue, I might throw in another Decay. Um, there's just all kinds of things I can do uh, with that particular section of the sideboard, and it really varies between matches. Then I have three Golgari Charm. Uh, Golgari Charm is a great sideboard card. Uh, each and every mode is quite relevant when it comes to sideboarding. Uh, the first mode, all creatures get minus one, minus one until in a turn, is really good against Mono Blue because it can deal with Master of Waves quite well because it can kill all of the tokens. Enchantment Destruction is, of course, sideboard territory, um, so it can destroy you know, those pesky detention spheres, Underworld Connections, Chain to the Rocks, just any enchantment that you need it to, or regenerate each creature you control so it's effective against the blue-white control matchup to effectively counter Supreme Verdict. The final card I have on the sideboard is Whip of Erebos, and it's just there um, if whenever it would behoove me to have some more life gain, because uh, it gives all my guys lifelink, and it can reanimate my guys, uh, if only for one turn. So uh, the interaction with Obzidod is definitely very, very nice. Uh, for those of you that uh, haven't figured it out, um, you can, if Obzidot were to die, uh, you can reanimate it uh, with the whip, 
you can use the exile trigger on Obzod himself to exile him before the trigger on the whip would resolve, and then you can keep bringing him back like usual, so it effectively keeps uh, Obzadot alive permanently, which is very, very nice. So again, useful in the more aggressive matchups where I need the life gain, uh, and also useful in the grindier matchups when I just need to, the ability to slowly drain them. So that's it for this deck tech. Thank you all very much for watching. To see these decks in action, check out our gameplays, and also be sure to check out our other deck techs to see all the decks we've covered on the channel. Thanks for visiting, and if you like what you see, subscribe for more Magic the Gathering content.